Good morning. Welcome everyone that's present here in the sanctuary or watching online. Welcome to Jacksonville First United Methodist Worship. I am B. Gwen, the youth director, and this morning I am your lay liturgist. And also Nathan asked me to let y'all all know if you're not aware yet, but our office, the Building Connection Center, has reopened. So we, yes, so the staff is there, yes. I say that like we haven't been there. We have been there, but now just more present and available for, for you to come and to see us. Today is going to be a wonderful, wonderful day of worship. You know, in Psalms 10, 104, it says, Enter into his gates with thanksgiving into his courts with praise and be thankful unto him and bless his name. You know, we are so honored to do that today as we entered the doors of our sanctuary or joined in online. We will go, we will actually do this through song. We will be singing some wonderful, wonderful hymns to praise God today. Holy, 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 victory in Jesus. And also one of our members, Mr. John Browler, will be special will be offering a very special recording music of At the Cross. And Nathan will continue our series, his sermon series on, the, on Jesus, the prophet, the priest, and the king. And see how Jesus meets our needs in a daily basis. And if you want to go ahead, if you're like me, I do this a lot. I like to have my Bible in front of me when the reading of the scripture. It's always on, on the book you know, in front of you on the screen, but if you're like me, I like to see the words in front of me, hold that Bible. So with today, you can turn to Acts 3, 11, 22 to be prepared for that. But before we do that, I would like to actually share a prayer. And the prayer I want to open our worship with this morning is a prayer that one of my youth minister mentors actually opened up a worship service for a retreat that I went on several years ago with the Arkansas Conference Youth Ministers. So uh, if you don't mind bowing your head for the prayer, opening prayer. Mighty God, everything you do reveals your glory and majesty. Open our eyes to see what you are doing in our lives. Let us marvel at your good gifts and your wise provision. Your acts are amazing, Lord. We cannot comprehend the number of blessings that you pour out on us each day today. As we gather today around your name, we pray that you will fill our hearts, our minds, and our souls. Transform us, Lord, and make us more like you. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. At this time, this is another first, which is so exciting. Mr. Robert Meadows will be leading us this morning in our opening hymn, Holy, Holy, Holy. And at this time, if you are able to stand, either here in the sanctuary or at home, let's stand and join together in song. Oh, my. 
Amen. And now we pass it over to Mrs. Stephanie with Messy Church. Didn't remember how to turn it on. <laughs> it's just one of those days. So, we are in the sanctuary today because we have no internet. So, have you ever heard of monitor and adjust? Or when you make plans, God laughs? That's what we're doing this morning. <laughs> we have done... Yeah. So... He loves to laugh. We, we've been doing this internet church for over a year. This is the first Sunday we haven't had internet, y'all. I mean, really. But we monitor and adjust and we make it work for us. So we brought the kids to y'all. Isn't that fun? Are y'all excited to be back in the big church? Yeah. Okay, so last week we began learning about Jesus having three offices. And those offices that Jesus hold are Jesus as a prophet, Jesus as a priest, and Jesus as a king. So Jesus is a prophet because he teaches us the will of God, and we need him to teach us because we don't know everything. Did y'all know you don't know everything? That's why you have to go to school and Sunday school. Even though you may question your parents, you still don't know everything. I know I have two at home that think they're smarter than their mom and dad. But this week, we're learning about Jesus being a priest. Why do you think Jesus has to be a priest for us? Because he died and he took our sins away. And he begs God to forgive us. And we need him to do that because we're guilty. We're born guilty. And we're always guilty. We're sinners. We can't help it, can we? So, what are some of your sins? Call them out, even if you're in the congregation. Pride. What are some others? What? Judging. Jealousy. Greed. What'd you say, Kat? Lying. Lying. That's a big one for kids. Yes. All right. So we're going to finish filling this canvas up. It's upside down right now. And then Miss Stephanie looks really bad today. You know, I'm wearing my yard clothes. Because... We have messy church, so we get messy, right? We, we do some crazy things over, over in that gym. So we covered Mr. Jim's boxes up with tablecloths, and we're going to throw paint-filled balloons at this canvas and cover our sins up. Will that be fun? Except we're probably going to have to actually poke them with a thumbtack because they're not quite heavy enough to pop. And I don't think your parents would appreciate me letting you sit on balloons filled with paint. I think I may lose my job over that one. What do you think, Kenley? Yeah. But do you know what? When Miss Lisa and Miss Dolores were helping me fill balloons up, do you know they tricked me? And I got paint in my mouth. And then I had paint all over my hair. So, uh, cuckoo. Yes, Glenn. Cuckoo. Yes. All right, so let's get back to our lesson. Let's pretend we're in a courtroom and there's a judge in his robe and someone's done something bad, like put paint in the children's director's mouth. And we're waiting for the judge and the jury to punish him. And the room is completely silent. And the judge speaks and says that this person's guilty and is going to go to jail for the rest of his life. And then the judge's son enters the room and says, no, I'm going to go to jail for that person for the rest of his life so he doesn't have to. 
That breaks the judge's heart because his son is going to go to jail for the rest of his life. And the one that's actually guilty is set free. Now, does that story sound familiar? What's it sound like, Lisa? When Jesus died on the cross for us, right? Yes. So we're all guilty because of our sin. And sin just means that we've missed the mark that God has set for us. Okay? Everyone who has ever been born has sinned. But Jesus came to be our mediator. And he died on the cross so that we could be forgiven for our sins. And God loved us enough to send his son so that if we believe in him, we could have life with him forever. And do you know what a mediator is? Okay, it's a go-between. So if there's two people that are having an argument, like you and Declan, which probably happens a lot because your eyes just got really big when I said that. So what do you call your grandma? Mimi? Is that right? What? Okay. So she is probably going to come between you and calm you down, right? And, and tell you that that's not nice and you need to say sorry. So she's your mediator, okay? So that's like Jesus. He's our mediator with God. So he helps us be friends with God, even though it costs Jesus his life. All right? Let's pray. All right, we're going to do a repeat after me prayer, which we don't do much anymore, do we? All right, repeat after me. Jesus, thank you for being our mediator and our priest. Please give us grace to love you and obey you. Help us to remember to trust in you. For you will make our path straight. Amen. All right, now let's go in the gym and throw some paint balloons. What do you say? All right. It's, it's good to have our kids in worship today, and um, to be honest, B, do you mind taking my sermon? Could you preach today? Because I want to go throw balloons, if that's all right. Uh, you take care of it. <laughs> We're going to have, they're going to have a lot of fun, a lot of fun. Um, what a joy it is to be in worship together, to come together and celebrate God's love for those of you who are joining us online. Even though we aren't currently online, we're going to record the service and put it online. So for those who are at home, we want to say welcome to them as well as we continue in worship. Before we have our pastoral prayer, I want to say thank you to our congregation. Uh, you know, this past year has been uh, a tumultuous year, you could say the least, with the pandemic. And yet our congregation has continued to remain faithful. And we have continued to have worship because people have continued to be good stewards. And we have continued to be able to upgrade and do things because of that. And our missions have continued to go out into our community because people have continued to be faithful. And this past week, I got the opportunity on Friday to go to Methodist Family Health. And for those of you who aren't familiar, Methodist Family Health is a behavioral uh, institution for children. Uh, they have a behavioral hospital as well as uh, it used to be an orphanage and they have a home, a, a home for kids as well. And during the season of Lent, we collected items for the behavioral hospital. And I got to take a whole truckload of items of, of towels and caddies, uh, shower caddies and sh soaps and shampoos and all, as well as a check for 270 some odd dollars to them. And they were so excited to receive it. And so thank you for your generosity and thank you for continuing to uh, be the church in the world, even though it's been difficult, to say the least, to be the church. With that said, let us go to the Lord in prayer this morning. Lord, we are grateful to be your people, honored to be sheep of your pasture, honored to be called into your life and love. We give you thanks, O oh God, that you give us grace and mercy. That we indeed fall short of your glory. We walk away, we're prone to wonder, and yet you forgive us. 
And we can approach your your throne boldly because your grace is sufficient. Your power made perfect in weakness. And so we ask, O Lord, today that you would receive our confessions. That we would offer up to you our full lives. That we won't hide anything, whether good or bad, from you. For we know that you offer us grace and mercy, an opportunity to to new life. And so we bring before you all that we are. For you indeed are our priest. You represent us before God. And you are a merciful priest, a gracious priest, a holy priest, who invites us into new life. You also understand what we go through. You sympathize with us. You have walked the walk that we have journeyed upon. And you know the temptations we face. You understand the sins that we enact. You understand our thoughts. And so you are a faithful representative of us before God. And so, Lord, we bring our full selves to you, recognizing it's not always pretty and yet you embrace us you love us and call us forward into new life so on this day oh god we ask that your spirit would join us that we would experience the freeing power of your love and that we would be called into the transformation of life that you have given us help us understand what it means to be your disciples help us to live faithfully help us to be good stewards and be ambassadors of your kingdom. We pray all these things in the name of Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Do y'all believe that God has a sense of humor? Well, actually, Nathan starts signaling a while ago that y'all probably couldn't see. Like, look at your phone, look at your phone, look at your phone. So he has changed our scripture. Our God had him to change the scripture. So we need to turn to Hebrews 4. 14 through 16. And if you are, like I said earlier, if you want to open your own Bible, I'll give you a chance to do that. 4, 14 through 16. Following the scripture reading, Mr. John Browler will be sharing at the cross. It is, I have to say, it's beautiful. He actually did it for a request out of me to do a video that was shared with y'all over the Holy Week. If you didn't see it, go back to our website. And the youth did two prayers, one at the beginning, one at the end, and he did that at the cross. So it's just beautiful. So now for the reading of our scripture, if you do not mind standing, please, out of respect for his word. So then, since we have a great high priest who has entered heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to what we believe. This high priest of ours understands our weaknesses, for he faced all of the same testings we do, yet he did not sin. So let us come boldly to the throne of our gracious God. There we will receive his mercy, and we will find grace to help us when we need it the most. This is the reading of the word for the people of God. You may be seated. This place where mercy reigns 
and ever dies There's a place where streams of grace flow deep and wide Where all the love I've ever found comes like a flood comes flowing down At the cross, at the cross I surrender my life I'm in all of you I'm in all of you Where you love ran red And my sin washed white I owe all to you I owe all to you, Jesus. There's a place where sin and shame are powerless. Where my heart has been with God and forgiveness where all the love I've ever found comes like a flood comes flowing down at the cross at the cross I surrender my life I'm in all of you, I'm in all of you, where you love ran red and my sin washed white, I owe all to you, I owe all to you, here my hope is found, here on holy ground, here I I am incredibly grateful this morning for many reasons. Um, one, we have talented people in our church who lead us in worship. Uh, two, as you can see, we've had to adapt a lot today because of uh, our internet provider is down. And so the things we normally do, we had to make very quick calls and Stephanie and others just stepped right in. Three, we are already making changes today. Uh, Robert was coming to sing in person, which meant we had to figure out how to get words on the screen. So I threw a whole big ball at our tech crew up there and they have just done fantastic with it and it yes incredibly grateful for the community that God surrounds us with when we need it the most right God has certainly blessed us in so so many ways would you join with me in a word of prayer oh Lord we are grateful to be your people honored to be sheep of your pasture Honored that you meet us where we are. That your grace and mercy never dies. It never comes to an end. 
but it flows freely from you. We ask, O oh Lord, that we would take hold of that grace, that we would understand it, that we would not take advantage of it, but that it would go to work in our souls to make us into the people you call us to be. O oh Lord, we come with gratitude that you are present with us and that you are here. Speak to us once more your message of hope and life. We give you thanks for your word. And having heard it, we ask that it would be planted in our hearts. Allow my words to be your words and my heart your heart. If anything that I say be untrue, let it fall away and never be remembered. But in all things, may you receive honor and glory and praise through Christ our Lord. Amen. So last week we began a sermon series talking about Jesus and his role in our life on an everyday basis. How do we encounter Jesus regularly? And the church over the course of centuries talked about three roles that Jesus played in every a person's life. The role of prophet, the role of priest, and the role of king. In fact, as I was preparing for this week's sermon, Stephanie uh, came into the office and uh, we were talking about it. She goes, you know, we were talking about your series and I kept thinking, I've heard this before somewhere and I couldn't remember where I'd heard it. And uh, she, she said, I was thinking about it and I realized that at one point when we lived in Little Rock, we were going to a Lutheran church. And in the Lutheran church, they have their catechism. The catechism is what is used to teach new believers uh, what the faith is in the, in the Lutheran church, the catechism. And uh, as they were walking through the catechism in the Lutheran church, the Lutheran church talks about Jesus as prophet, priest, and king. And it is part of their regular catechism. All to say that the church historically, whether a Methodist, a Lutheran, Presbyterian, uh, Catholic, the church historically has talked about Jesus in these roles. Jesus as prophet, Jesus as priest, and Jesus as king. And last week we talked about Jesus as the prophet, Jesus as a prophet. And if you recall, or if you missed out last week, we talked about the prophets of old, the Old Testament. And in the Old Testament, the prophets played one key role. They were heralds of God's kingdom, and they helped to point out the place where the people were, as well as the place where God wanted the people to be, or the future that God wanted to have. So in some cases, when the people, for instance, were in exile, uh, the prophets recognized the despair and the depression and the anxiety that the people experienced being away from home, and pointed to God's good future that, was taking, that would come into existence that God had not uh, forgotten them. God had not forgotten their cries, but God was going to listen to them. On the other hand, too, some of the other prophets uh, recognized where the people uh, were, and it wasn't the place God wanted them to be because they had failed to obey. They had been disobedient. Uh, they had forgotten God's word, and God wanted them to be in a different place. Take, for instance, Amos. Amos called the people to justice. They had forgotten the poor, and they had forgotten the covenant that they had made with God to take care of the poor and the downcast, and yet they were taking advantage of the poor, and so he called them into a new existence. The prophets uh, functioned to awaken people to the reality of their lives, and the early church recognized that Jesus is a prophet who awakens us to the reality of our lives. And at times when Jesus the prophet shows up and awakens us, it can be a rude awakening. It can be shocking to figure out where we are and where God wants us uh, to be. Reminds me of a couple of weeks ago, uh, my uh, six-year-old daughter has learned to ride her bicycle without training wheels, and she loves to ride her bike. And about uh, a, a couple of weeks ago, three or four weeks ago, uh, we went on a walk. Uh, we went around the neighborhood, and I was pushing our infant daughter in the stroller, and Eleanor was on her bike. And when she first learned to ride her bike, it was all or nothing, right? You know, there was no medium speed. It was either no speed or 100 miles an hour. Right? If you ever had a kid, you probably understand this. And so uh, we started walking, and boom, off she went. And she was almost out of sight when all of a sudden she disappeared. And I knew immediately she had had an accident. It was the first major bike wreck that she had had, and it was not a good one either. It was a bad, bad wreck. And uh, she had hit this uh, slick spot on the sidewalk and just went down immediately. And she was covered in head to toe uh, with mud and everything. 
and her knees were all bruised up and they were bleeding uh, really badly. And I got there, and of course, she's crying and fussing, and sh but she didn't recognize how bad it was because I said, okay, let's walk home. And she just <laughs> sobbing and not looking and not paying attention. And, uh, and usually, if she would have recognized how bad it was, she would have gone berserk. And uh, we, I would have had to carry her on my shoulder trying to push Eleanor or trying to push Lydia and get the bike home as well. But she didn't recognize it. She just walked, bleeding from her elbows and her knees, walking home as if nothing had occurred. That is until I told her, okay, let's go to the bathroom and let's clean you up and let's put some band-aids on your boo-boos and get some of the blood off. And as soon as I said that, she looked down. And she realized where she was and what was going on. And at that moment, she went berserk. The shock wore off. And when she, aware, when she was aware of what was happening, it changed her perspective. And I like to think about how that is sometimes how when Jesus the prophet encounters us, we've been walking around with bloody knees and elbows and uh, we've been blinded. And suddenly Jesus says to us, this is the kingdom of God, and this is what it looks like. This is what you are called to. And when we see the state of where we are, suddenly we realize we're in bad shape. We are in bad, bad shape. Sometimes we come to the recognition, and we discover things like, indeed, we are full of pride. We are gluttonous, and we are greedy. You know, I heard a lot of confessions today, you know, in the children's moment. We are unloving. We don't care for our neighbor. And all these truths are kind of hard to swallow when we first come to this recognition that this is where we are, and yet God calls us into a different life. So Christ the prophet comes to awaken us so that we might be pointed in the right direction. We've wandered off the path. And Christ comes to us, whether we're first new to the faith, whether we've never been in the faith, or even if we've been in the faith for 30 years, sometimes Christ the prophet shows up and we go, oh my, this is, this is bad. But he comes to point us in the right direction. Interestingly enough, in the book of Hebrews, the, the, one of the main themes of the book of he Hebrews is that of a journey or that of a wandering. Hebrews is written as a sermon, and it's written in such a way for the people to understand where they are in the journey. And one of the images that the, the author of Hebrews uses to talk about this journey is that of the Israelites. And you may remember in the Old Testament, the Israelites uh, were slaves in Egypt, and Moses was called by God to free them. We, we all remember probably the song, if we were kids, we remember, uh, Pharaoh, Pharaoh. Oh, baby, let my... Okay, just making sure you remember. Let my people go. And Moses comes, and he frees the people, and they wander in the wilderness for how many years? For 40 years. For 40 years. Their goal was to reach the promised land, to get there, to find rest, as Hebrew calls, as Hebrews calls it. But they wander for 40 years because they don't realize how much they need God, how much they need God. But Hebrews calls the promised land this place of rest, a place of rest. If you want to learn more about it, you can turn to Hebrews chapter 3. And Hebrews 3, at the end of Hebrews 3, talks about uh, this place of rest and that the Israelites are called into this place of rest. And of course, what Hebrews is talking about when it says this place of rest, he's not talking about, uh, the author's not talking about uh, a place of where we go when we die. He's not talking about some place not present in the world. But this place of rest is an actual place or an actual uh, existence, an actual state of being in the world. It's not so far out of the future it can't be experienced now. It is like the promised land. It is like the promised land. In that promised land, which was given to the people where they would get to live with God 
and enjoy a land flowing with milk and honey and enjoy the life that God had blessed the world with and yet did not quite understand it yet. That life and that rest is for us even now. Listen to Hebrews chapter 4, verse 1, earlier in, from the scripture passage we read today. Therefore, while the promise of entering his rest is still open, let us take care that none of you should seem to have failed to reach it. That promise that is still open the rest that we are called to, that Jesus gifts us in the world, that rest that points back to creation itself when God created all things and on the seventh day God rested. And what that means is God delighted in the creation God had made. God spent time walking through the garden. God spent time enjoying being with Adam and Eve. God spent time delighting in life itself. And that rest is still attainable for us today. It's still there, still for us. But what prevents us from living in that rest is that we have wandered off the path. We've been journeying toward that rest, and yet we began wandering in the wilderness because we have failed to see the beauty, the rest that God has given us. This is what God wants for all of us. You know, sometimes I think we as a church have put too much emphasis on life after death rather than life in life itself. That the salvation that God brings to us in Jesus Christ is a freedom to enjoy that delight in one another, in community, in, in, in relationship with God in God's very self, that this is the salvation that God offers that starts now and continues on into the rest of the future. And so often we have put the emphasis on the future and forgotten the present reality that God gifts us in Jesus' life, death, and resurrection. We are called to this rest where sin does not reign. And how easily we get off that path. Just before our passage today, Hebrews 4 says this. Hebrews 4, 12 and 13. Listen to how it sounds like Jesus the prophet. Indeed, the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing until it divides soul from spirit, joints from marrow. It is able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. And before him no creature is hidden. But all are naked and laid bare to the eyes of the one to whom we must render account. God sends forth God's word into the world, which pierces the heart, which awakens the soul to see the true state of who we are in the world. And yet the reason why Jesus the prophet comes is not to shame us or guilt us, but to help us see where we are and to lead us into the arms of Jesus the priest. The one who is merciful. The one who is gracious. The one who helps us find our way back to God. Find our way back so that we can enjoy rest. Hebrews tells us that Jesus is our great high priest. Now the priests of the Old Testament played two roles. They played the role of one, representing the people before God. And two, representing God before the people. Now, you may know a little bit about Judaism and the practice of the priests, but there was a day called Yom Kippur. And on Yom Kippur, it was the day of atonement, the day when all sins were to be forgiven. And, you, and as was the practice, uh, the, the high priest, the, 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 big, the big one, the big guy, right? The high priest would go into the Holy of Holies and go before the mercy seat and plead on behalf of the people that God would forgive them. It was no laughing matter either. It was a pretty serious thing. In fact, the high priest would wear bells on, uh, on their clothes, on his clothes, so that, uh, that the people could still hear the high priest walking around in case God decided to strike the priest down and kill him. And if that were the case, they had tied a rope around his ankle. And if he 
fell over dead, they could pull him out from the Holy of Holies and bring him back. That's how serious they took it. That the priests would represent the people before God, pleading on their behalf. And the high priest was not necessarily a special person. They are from a certain lineage. But the high priest was a person. A person. And God called that person who understood the plight of the people to come before and to represent them before God. And at the mercy seat, they would plead their case. And on the end of Yom Kippur, they would proclaim forgiveness to all the people. Hebrews says Jesus is our high, high priest who is able to sympathize with our weakness. We have one who in every respect has been tested as we are. Amy Wheeler, who's a professor of New Testament studies at Wheaton College, says this. Jesus is the kind of priest we need in the situation in which we find ourselves. Standing before a God who has spoken to them, whose speech revealed our whole being, who is awaiting a response, we have a representative who is sympathetic to our situation but he is not stuck in it. He understands why you and I have made the decisions we have made, but he can also lead us out because he chose a different path. Reminds me of a story. I've told this actually probably a couple of times in our uh, uh, preaching here, but I think it's an appropriate sermon. You may remember the story about uh, the man who was walking down the road and he fell in a hole and he couldn't get out of the hole. He couldn't figure out how to climb out of the hole. And, uh, and so while he was down in the hole, uh, a doctor walked by, and the doctor walked by and said, uh, Hey, can, can, uh, can I help you? And the guy said, Yeah, I can't get out of this hole. Can you help me figure out how to get a hole? And the doctor wrote a prescription, and he threw it down in the hole and walked on. Well, then a pastor came by and uh, saw this guy in the hole, and the guy yelled out, Hey, can you help me out of this hole? And uh, the guy said, or the pastor said, Sure, I can help you out. So he knelt down, and he prayed, and then he got up, and he said, I hope you can get you out, and he walked. Walk, kept walking. Man still stuck in the hole. Well, not too long after that, a friend came by, and a friend came by and saw his friend down in the hole and said, Hey, can you help me out? Can you get me out of this hole? And uh, the guy said, Sure. So he jumped down in the hole. The guy said, What are you doing? What are you doing? He said, Now we're both stuck in the hole. And his friend said, Oh, no. And I've been down in this hole before, and I know the way out. Jesus climbed down in the hole with us, sympathizes with us in our weakness, and knows the way out. Jesus is our high priest. He represents the people, but he also represents God, our high priest. The word of the prophet Jesus comes and exposes our hearts, exposes us to who we really are, the reality of our lives. But Jesus the priest says, My child, I forgive you. I forgive you. Jesus who sits at the right hand of God offers us grace so that the guilt, the shame, the insecurity, the anxiety of what it might mean to follow Jesus can be lifted. I once heard a quote that I think is appropriate. It says, People need not be reminded of their brokenness. For they live it every day. But a word of grace can crack the human heart and free it. A word of grace that when we see the state of who we are, God says, it's okay. Let's go clean up those wounds. Be made well. And let's get on the journey once again to rest and to life. I don't know where each of you are today. I don't know if the Holy One has awakened you to the state of your soul. Or if you find yourself wandering away you strayed off the path or if you are walking faithfully in it. 
know one thing. Jesus, the high priest, loves you, forgives you, and calls you into a joyful life here and now. May it be so in the name of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen. We have opportunity to profess our faith before God. I invite you to stand as we recite the Apostles' Creed. As we do so, remember these words from Hebrews. Therefore, let us approach the throne of grace with boldness, so that we may receive mercy and find the grace to help us in our time of need. Let us recite the creed together. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. As we continue in worship, we have opportunity to consider some, op- some ways to be uh, growing in our discipleship, what we call discipleship moments now, uh, some ways that uh, we can grow in our life of faith. Today we've been challenged to consider Jesus as our high priest and how we can be on the journey. So I would invite you, if you feel like you have wandered off the path, there are ways that you can find yourself on the path. A great way to do that is through our life groups or our Sunday school classes. And if you don't have a life group, uh, you can talk to me after the service or contact Stephanie Dunn, our Christian education coordinator, and we can get you connected with a life group. This is a place where you can grow in your life of faith and uh, be supported in your life of faith and as well as continue on the journey. Also, you can join in community activities here at the church if you want to uh, continue to walk with Jesus. One of those opportunities is our senior parade next Sunday. Next Sunday is Senior Sunday. We'll have a parade at 4 p.m. No, I'm sorry. At 4 p.m. Sorry, I wrote it down wrong. At 4 p.m., and we'll be in our parking lot and come and support our seniors. And if you're new to the church, it would be a great way just to meet new people, and we invite you to do that. Third thing you could do is join our focus night, our first ever focus night. We were having one of these when the pandemic struck and uh, and we had to cancel it. But focus stands for families overcoming chaos united in the spirit. My life is chaotic. I don't know about yours, but I look for an opportunity to be in community where it's not chaotic. So we will have a focus night on May the 23rd. And it'll be a tailgate where you bring your own food, we'll social distance and all. And we'll have some social distance games and we'll have ice cream served in a safe way. If you just want to be in community with people, and I know many of us are thirsty for that because of the pandemic and being isolated, you can come on May the 23rd. Lastly, if you are a woman looking to grow in your life of faith, our Tuesday Women's Bible Study is starting a new study. And it'll be a great way to encounter the grace of God. They will be starting a study uh, entitled, Living Love When We Disagree. I think we all need that as well. So if you are a female wanting to join, it's Tuesday at 9.30, and I encourage you to do that. Currently, they meet on Zoom and may even have an in-person opportunity later as well. So uh, those, are, those are some ways that we can continue to be disciples. With that said, let us stand and sing our closing hymn of praise. It's uh, Victory in Jesus, and uh, one of my favorite hymns, I hope so, is yours. Let's sing together and sing it with uh, gusto. Sing it loud and proud as we celebrate God's victory. Amen. 
Thank you all for singing. Thank you for joining. One of the, it reminds me, when I was a kid, I remember uh, there used to be Sunday evening services at the church my dad served. And uh, every Sunday evening service, you'd get to, the congregation would yell out what hymns they wanted to play. And, uh, and so that's often the way the hymns were chosen for the Sunday evening service. And every week, a gentleman by the name of L.C. Tenman, he had to be probably in his 80s, he would stand back at the very back and he'd raise his hand real high and he would yell out, 370, victory in Jesus. And of course, L.C. wanted people to be reminded that they are victorious, that they are forgiven, they are free, and they get to enter into the life that God has blessed them with. So may we go with that same victory in the world. May we understand that God has blessed us unbelievably, that we are forgiven and set free. May we go with that knowledge in the name of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in grace and peace.